Well, hello and welcome to the Dividend Cafe. I am uh, at the end of our annual Money Manager Week and here in New York City. Uh, by the time you're watching this, actually, I should be back to California. Um, I'm recording from my apartment at the end of the day on Thursday, and it's been an absolute whirlwind of a week. It, uh, our last meetings concluded this afternoon with a luncheon event at the, uh, the Economic Club of New York put on with Federal Reserve Chairman Jay Powell. And prior to that, the money manager and hedge fund meetings and so forth, um, a couple of the research firms we work with, we really had a very busy schedule, but um, as always is the case, very enlightening, uh, illuminating. And I will take advantage of my time on the plane Friday to get a lot of the takeaways organized and condensed and, and written up. Uh, so count on hearing a lot more about this week. I want to let the, these things appropriately percolate and come back because there's definitely some actionable items and, and some key takeaways I think will be fun to summarize for those who are interested in that deeper dive. What I decided to do with this week's Dividend Cafe is uh, go, get caught up again with the questions that come in. We try to answer one or two per day in the DC Today, but Sometimes the volume gets uh, up to a level where there's a few that build up and we can use this to uh, answer the questions in Dividend Cafe. But of course, it's not really about merely responding to somebody. I could always just do that. And in fact, I do quite a bit, just respond directly by email and it doesn't necessarily make the print. Um, the reason that I think this is an effective way to do Dividend Cafe about once a quarter is that you know the questions cover topics that are probably on everybody's mind. And, and that's the idea is to cover a multitude of topics from real life questions that then can, you know, help ho hopefully be helpful to, to a wider audience. And it doesn't hurt that this week, not only am I trying to do that for you all, but um, the idea of writing a whole Dividend Cafe after this week, I have a big dinner event downtown tonight. And then leaving at five in the morning Friday. It just sort of works out to make this a Q&A. So let's get into it. The first one was somebody wondering about um, a dividend, our, our desire to see dividend growth in the holdings that we buy um, and our equity portfolio strategy revolving around companies that can, that can consistently and do consistently grow their dividend and what type of grace we allow for sort of extraordinary items that when um, something comes up unexpected, could it even be a positive for the company to not raise the dividend and maybe even cut it because of maybe a cyber attack or an unforeseen uh, impediment or interruption to business? And I think it's a very good question. And the answer, though, is very reaffirming of what we believe about the dividend growth portfolio integrity, which is I do believe there are times that the right thing for a company to do may be to cut their dividend. Um, but I do not believe that it is right for us to own that company. And that the exceptions uh, that I've seen where um, we don't even necessarily mind that a company had cut the dividend in the past, were forward looking, is, is um, one of the best examples is coming out of the financial crisis, there were certain huge banks. There's one that we bought after the financial crisis that we still own to this day that they, uh, their dividend cut was forced upon them by the Federal Reserve. Now, most of the companies, the financial firms that were cutting the dividend then didn't bring it back for years and in some cases still haven't. Uh, because they were in no position to do so. And they are still all good, medium, and bad companies, ones that were good, medium, or bad at the time of the financial crisis, or good, medium, or bad now. They're still subject to very intense Federal Reserve stress tests every year. But we didn't hold against some companies that we believe had managed their affairs well through the financial crisis, that actually were liquidity providers to the country and that have been in an absolutely robust position of annual dividend growth ever since, 
based on the Federal Reserve forcing them at that time. Now, we didn't own it when it happened. We bought it after. But my point being, that's an example where we want to do discernment about past events as we think through the future. And we're well aware that if you're going to own large financials in the United States, post GFC, post Dodd-Frank, that the Federal Reserve is going to be telling you if you can and cannot pay a dividend. And we factor that into our, our thinking. But the example of like a cyber attack, the example of a business interruption, to me, is part of the reason we care so much about a firm's balance sheet, the defensiveness within the company operation and company capital structure that allows them to be able to maintain a dividend through a business interruption so that they can take a hit and still have the balance sheet strength to persevere. When one is over levered or has a very high dividend payout ratio with no margin of error and then has some sort of intervening event, extraneous event, um, it's un, they obviously would be in a, a very weakened position for dividend payment. But we want to own companies that we think have the durability to continue. And I'll look at a couple of the largest oil and gas companies in the world that we own and have owned for a very long time. That they basically went to zero dollar oil during COVID because of the excess supply, excess inventory, um, lack of storage capacity, uh, lack of any demand. Um, you had just a, as bad a circumstance as you could make up and the companies were able to maintain their dividend, but they weren't able to do that because the cash flows were so good in that period. It's because they had levers around both their balance sheet strength and their ability to decrease capital expenditures for a period of time and then ramp those back up when appropriate. And so those were extraneous circumstances that you would think like, Hey, that'd be okay if they cut the dividend then. Right. And yet they still did not and that's a byproduct of the defensiveness that they've embedded in their financial structure. And that is the defensiveness we really like. So we would always take it case by case, but there have been companies that um, we believed were going to cut the dividend and we decided to sell and they ended up cutting the dividend later. And almost always, it's a very, very bad situation. There are times it could be the right thing for the company to do. There are also times that we believe the risk reward trade-off indicates a dividend cut could come and that we just make the decision to exit and it doesn't end up coming. And um, I wouldn't change a thing because our job is not to predict the future. It's to think about the risk reward trade-offs around those scenarios. That's how we think about it. Great question. Much appreciated. Jeff had asked what I think about the dollar's reserve currency status when you have China and Russia uh, allegedly wanting to end that reserve status um, and, and maybe cut them out of international because of what the U.S. has done to impact China and Russia's presence in the international banking system. Um, is there some fear of China and Russia ending the dollar's reserve status? I've obviously written about this a lot. I've talked about it a lot. I've devoted a whole podcast with, with Sam Rines to this subject, but it's worth repeating because the media harps on it and a lot of people in the professional fear-mongering industry harp on this, that, oh, the U.S. will lose its dollar status. And I, first of all, want to remind people of a difference between reserve currency and transactional currency. When you talk about Middle Eastern countries trading oil and gas with China, and something like 0.003% of transactions have now gone in the yuan instead of petrodollar, which is 0.003% more than before. But nevertheless, let's not get carried away here, okay? Um, that is still settling at the end of the day in dollars. In other words, what people end up holding in their reserves are dollars. And for the very simple reason that um, a country like China doesn't allow the free flow of capital. Nobody is going to use Chinese currency as the currency they hold in their reserves. It is the free flow of the dollar. You say, well, yeah, but um, the dollar, sometimes they, they do reckless things with American fiscal policy. You still have to show me a company, a country that does less reckless things. That's hard to come by. You look at monetary policy. Right now, we're actually tighter than a lot of, you know, you're getting a higher yield to carry U.S. denominated 
dollar-denominated treasuries, for example, than you are most other countries. But that has not been the case for a long period of time. And yet, even then, most other countries were attempting to weaken as well. So you have a fiscal and monetary race to the bottom. Everybody's bad, and the dollar represents the best neighborhood, the best house in the bad neighborhood type of deal. But ultimately, I think that trade flows, capital flows, economic strength, military strength, it isn't like there's this second place country coming up on our heels. It's just simply not even close. And I think people fail to understand the reserve currency versus transactional. And I think they fail to understand the relative nature of how foreign exchange currency works to begin with. And I simply do not fear the dollar losing reserve status anytime soon. Someone asked about a California governor, uh, Gavin Newsom, uh, had signed a bill that increased the minimum wage for fast food workers to $20 an hour, what my thought on the ramifications to that would be. Um, I think that, uh, and by the way, there, it doesn't have to limit this to Newsom in California because there's higher minimum wage in a lot of states and, and there's been higher price pressure you know, for labor period. And so you know, the re higher cost of labor does that represent some kind of a, a problem, especially when it's you know government intervention, federal or state doing it? California's is unique to an industry and at a very high level. But the reality is that this is not me waxing and waning political. I'm just trying to provide a little economic common sense. These companies are going to end up paying less in total labor costs, not more. Um, it provides the incentive for them to accelerate plans to replace workers with kiosks and with technology and with solutions that do not go past the, the marginal utility. And so if it is affordable and reasonable and, and in the right cost benefits trade off that they're going for to pay someone 14 an hour and they have to go to 20 an hour at that level of unit cost divided by the massive amount of hours and workers, uh, they're already doing it. They're already replacing that burden with uh, technology. And would they clear a price for labor, for entry level, low skill labor without such a burdensome minimum wage? I think they would. Um, but I think technology comes in because of that government intervention. So I, I, I think this has a political overtone to it, but that's not my intent. I'm just very confident in my economic analysis on this. If the U.S. dollar is getting stronger, which it has been, obviously, uh, the last several months in particular, um, wouldn't we see imports increase? And, in other words, other countries' exports increase, which is our imports, because the other countries gain an advantage in trade. Um, they're receiving higher value dollars, and, and um, a weaker currency helps those export-driven companies. And then when they receive the dollars, wouldn't that cause them to buy more treasuries? And, and if that's the case, uh, wouldn't we you know, eventually see this current period of lower foreign ownership, lower foreign purchases of treasuries cycle through? That's the setup of the question. The answer is theoretically yes, by the way. But the reason the answer is practically no for now is that that construct, that setup, the framework isn't... Um, volatile. It can't be volatile. It has to become a bit more embedded. And right now, you actually had a lot of volatility. The dollar um, had weakened at some point a number of years ago, but then really strengthened substantially in 22. It had come back down a little in 23 before rallying again the last couple of months. And um, I think at this point now, we're actually over three months. So I think if you had a more stable, strong, rising dollar, that would result in theory, all else being equal to rising imports, which would result in more dollars having to be repatriated in the US. Now, one of the big theories that I'm very sympathetic to is that it, while people think China is buying less treasuries, that they're likely buying treasuries uh, to a, lower, a slower pace, but not as low as people think and, and holding them outside of US custodians it's a little harder to track, but that they're definitely buying uh, agency bonds, Fannie, Freddie bonds. I think it's $75 billion worth this year. And so they're still dollar denominating there. 
Um, so that is resulting in dollars coming back in, but instead of putting it into treasuries, they're putting it into, into a different type of dollar denominated US debt. But no, I basically would agree that at some point, if you see imports rise, you just got to remember that it's more than just dollar, relative dollar strength that would drive imports. You also need greater economic growth globally because then there's higher exports from other countries, higher imports, the U.S. countries, the production and consumption side working pro-cyclically. And that's why exports plus imports is indicative of greater economic strength. If you have weakening economic metrics or, or there is some sort of forward vision into weakening economic metrics, the currency that might become second place and you may still not get grower, higher imports. That's one of the issues with China right now and exports is that the weaker uh, economic conditions are just simply resulting in less uh, trade and therefore less on the back end of this question, less dollars that could be flowing into treasuries. Someone had asked, based on what I wrote in Dividend Cafe last week about the 50 years of Middle East tensions, the long precedent of uh, up, down, up, down, and the long-term story of what human nature really represents, manifested in geopolitics, and yet if there were to all of a sudden just be a real escalation, some very severe um, uh, break, that what would our kind of disposition about asset allocation be? And in a way, with all respect, the question is sort of like, okay, I read Dividend Cafe, but like, what if it really does get bad? And of course, what the Dividend Cafe said is, well, it has gotten bad and it will get bad. And I still am standing by my belief that there needs to be a properly constructed asset allocation in anyone's portfolio at any time that accounts for these realities of human nature. And so if what someone means is, well, what if there's a nuclear war that wipes out humanity? I find that prospect hard to think about hedging. I find, you know, World War Three, Four, and Five apocalypse stuff um, to produce unreliable counterparties. But if one just means, look, what if things really, really, really get scary? Do I really actually believe what I'm saying? And the answer is yes, I do. And in fact, there are times in which as an opportunistic and long-term investor, you know, those things, uh, I don't want any death. I don't want any destruction. I don't want bad things to happen to people. But bad things that can happen out of these tail risk events in the market are extremely opportunistic. I would love to buy more risk. The S&P is trading at 19 or 20 times earnings right now. I don't think people are exactly pricing in World War III here, okay? But to the extent that you had a significant move down in markets, catalyzed by an escalation in the Middle East, catalyzed by uh, China invading Taiwan, catalyzed by an economic re super recession in the United States, anything that people do love to think about, worry about, um, my response would not be to become more defensive. It would be to become much less defensive. Do I need to think about the ex-dividend date when buying a dividend stock? No, you don't. The market has already thought about it for you. Markets aren't dumb. It's already priced in. Finally, I want to reiterate about the similarities between China now and Japan in the late 80s, early 90s. I more or less believe that there are a lot of things playing out. An overinvestment and misallocation of capital and real estate property um, d declining demographics in terms of working age population, uh, various elements of governmental malfeasance that are problematic, some more sinister than others, but nevertheless, uh, incompetence in late 80s Japan and I think uh, communist evil in 2023 China. Do I think that it will all play out the same way? I do not. I did write a Divin Cafe about this a couple months ago. I think a lot of things could become very similar. And I do think on the fiscal side, China is facing a lot of pressure. They haven't fully given into all of it yet, but they're facing a lot of pressure to buy into this notion of, of Chinification, uh, which is a Japanification done in China, whereby they use a lot of fiscal stimulus to intervene. 
But do I think that the monetary policy will follow suit? It hasn't yet. And they've shown indications it may not, but we're very early innings. That would be, to me, the big question. Will China try to go to a zero bound? Will they go to yield curve control? Will they attempt to dramatically weaken their currency? Um, I, I think there's a lot of reason to believe they won't. But that would be the question uh, as to the real follow-up of China's economic predicament going the way of Japan. And, and so that's stuff that I'm going to be following for years to come, quite frankly. Okay, I'm going to leave it there. I do need to get to this event. I hope you got something out of this. We covered a lot of things. And I certainly welcome questions anytime. I love going through them. Um, I have very big plans for next week's Dividend Cafe. I'm quite excited, but I'm going to leave you in suspense. And with that, thank you as always, for reading and listening and watching The Dividend Cafe. We'll see you next week.